me and Terry, we covered a roughly 200 kilometer stretch of the Strait of Georgia. And what we were looking for was the indigenous marine life. We took samples along the coastline for 200 kilometers over nine low tide periods. And we found no life outside of four species. We found no bull kelp anywhere. We found none of the vegetation. We certainly found none of the sea anemones, which is the green you're seeing over there. We found no sun starfish. We found none of all the... You see those stalks? They should show up on all the rocks on the low tide. And those sea anemones should too. These are, this is a typical scenery. These tidal pools should be full of life. And around the rocks up close it would look like that. Totally full of life. And, and the dried up sacks you see, they're the big sea anemones. And when they flower, and you'll see them at the low tide line everywhere you go in British Columbia. And when they flower, they'll flower up. You'll see them a lot of the times looking like that. But underwater, once the water goes around them, these little sacks will expand up. But they're very visible at the low tide line. And so we'll, we'll move ahead. And here's some brightly colored ones that are typical of uh, tidal pools along the coastline at low tide. We covered nine days of low tide, the lowest tide each day. And this is the Wild West Coast. And so we're going to need to investigate all of that. Once again, there was no snails. There was no whelks. There was no other type of starfish, only the purple starfish. On the shorelines, there was no sea anemones. There was no mass populations of anything. In 200 kilometers, we could have took everything in a wheelbarrow in total that we've seen. There was none of the normal uh, tidal areas. There was nothing there in any place we went, in any of the pictures we took. There's over 600 species of algae and there's, I think, 94 species of sponges. None of the sponges were there. Up at the high tide line, there was none of the sea anemones and there was no kelp grass in most of the places. There was some of this left, but there was no sea anemones whatsoever. At the super moon we had yesterday and last night with a 1.8 foot tide up at Gibson's Molly Reach, we, we were expecting to see some kinds of marine life in those areas and we see nothing. We never seen any insects uh, in the entire time except for maybe four flies. We've seen probably five or ten um, wasps and bees in total in 200 kilometers. None hit our windshield when we were on the highway. None were embedded into the grills. These kelp forests, I used to dive in these kelp forests and get tangled up. And I used to describe it like being caught in a spider web. And I would take the regulator in my mouth and chew to the kelp to free myself up. And that's not a joke. I used to spend six hours a day. Uh, and so I'm intimately... You know, I have an intimate knowledge of the ocean year after year, 315 days a year, up to six hours a day on the ocean floor. I consider myself a connoisseur of Mother Nature. And these are familiar sights to me. And at low tide, I expect to see these. In 200 kilometers, we never seen any of these. The fact that we never seen any of the kelp forest, the bull kelp forest, which grows up to 60 feet in British Columbia, in a 40 kilometer a uh, boat ride on the shoreline through Desolation Sound, we've seen a few strands of bull kelp. It's, it's like the ocean is still hanging on to four species. And we'll run through some more pictures. These are typical, you should see these sea anemones, these white ones, on every wharf and every rock, even if there's nothing in the bay. And if not, the very next bay should be completely loaded like you're seeing here now, where it seems like there's too much. Well, the entire coast is missing them. And so these are filters. Do you see the little flowers that they're putting out? Right? So when they're dried up, let me get a handle on where I'm to here. And so I can explain that to you. This is what they look like underwater. This is what they look like when the tide goes out, right? If they're in that area. And so we never seen that or this anywhere at any time. We never seen any Clintons. Uh, and there's quite a few different variations of those. We never seen the tidal pools had nothing in them, zero, that a bird will starve to death 
on any of the beaches. So the migratory animals, the 140 species that normally depend upon the low tide and the migratory mud flats and everything else, there was nothing there. We need to go out and reinvestigate with high quality. So we're getting up to that part what uh, what we done real soon here. There was no hermit crabs anywhere on any of the rocks. There was no snails, there was no limpets, there was no nothing. It was devoid and we're going to show you all that coming up. This is what normal habitat looks like to me and every other commercial diver in British Columbia. I also dove the Atlantic uh, Eastern Seaboard extensively and I spent most of my life doing that. I did spend a lot of my life picking sea urchins because that was a huge industry. And so even in the shallowest waters, these will stick out. And you see the kelp in the background on the rocks. This is the normal, what you expect to see everywhere you went. And you would expect to see some of these big starfish. The habitat down just below the surface, just below the low tide line, is actually the low tide line, or the, the top 30 feet high tide line, low tide line, is the, the nursery of the ocean is the better way to put this to you. This is where all the little itty bitty creatures are gonna hang out, where all the oxygen and the ocean comes in and crashes and liberates the oxygen from the molecules and the atoms are you know, hitting the coastline and this is where it's just rich oxygen and that's why it's considered the nursery. The first 30 feet also gets the colors. After that you get shades of gray and what that translates into is photosynthesis in the ocean at the top, at the top part of the ocean, and that biohabitat is missing, and we're almost to that point right now. Once again, I want you to really understand the significance of not seeing uh, the 60, 70, 80 species that are indigenous British Columbia water of sea anemones. Not seeing them is the only red herring anybody really would need if they're a marine biologist, a fishery officer, or anything else. And when you cover 200 kilometers of coastline that you know is notorious for being pristine and these are all the samples. Now let's jump into what we've done. We went all the way up to Molly's Reach and so just for um, Molly's Reach is around right around where I'm to right now. We're moved around a bit because we got Terry here and Terry went, was out on all the beaches. Terry done all the walk and hurt his ankle kept going regardless. Nine days, low tides. The last tide we, we tried, that we got up, uh, left here at 4.30 in the morning and we never missed one, we understood. Here's another shot of me on groups at Wakefield Beach and we found we're coming to all of that now and so let's get started folks. Now this is outside of Lund this is about two kilometers south of Lund, and that's um, this side, south of Vancouver side of Desolation Sound. And let me bring you back that chart so I can give you some context. So uh, I got to pull my hand back. At the top up there, well, up there, is Desolation Sound. And so when you come back, I can't reach up there because my fingers will disappear. But you can see a name up there. It says. Um, I can't even read it. But the top of that island, basically, on the shoreline, is the sample. And I know this is rushed and everything because we got so much to get through. But we're gonna we're gonna start there with the show, and we're gonna show you what a, what the beaches starts to look like. And when you come up close, you see no whelks, you see no snails, you see no limpets, you see no sea anemones, and you barely see any vegetation. Now the rocks on the first couple of beaches, we really didn't understand the significance of what we were looking at and what we were doing. You got to realize we had a little tiny budget and that we went out with a theory not understanding what we were up against and what we were going to find. Not understanding that, you know, as the days progress. And so that's why you're going to see things the way you're going to see them. This is Wellington Beach. This is Powell River. So this affects a lot of people. So it's quite devastating. All of this is very devastating because it affects everybody on the planet, but it personally affects me because this is where I live. And so the bull kelp, once again, and the fluorescent kelp is dominating. There was no life there. This is a park. At the top of the picture, you can see a limpet. There's a limpet there. 
And there's a starfish. You can't see him, but there's one starfish there. Once again, right along the, the, the wharfy, the wharfing area where it was normally tons of life, there was no life. And that was Wellington Beach in Powell River. So we'll get up to the good stuff. Brew Bay is down the road. Now, Brew Bay had no life whatsoever except for four species it had and well I don't know if there was any purple starfish here there was only one or two at the other places but we got so much to get through we'll get some high quality coming up here some higher quality and we're going through a lot of pictures today uh, and you can see what I mean by patches just little patches of mussels nothing else no insects no sand fleas no flies uh, no no crows no indigenous wildlife whatsoever. Uh, there was no activity on the ocean. All the birds were missing. All the bull kelp is missing. Uh, you can see some of uh, the barnacles are hanging on. Most of it is dead. There is now. What's important is you see that twine on the mussel. That is missing from most of the mussels. But in this place, at least we we're finding that. And we got to keep going. I don't know how many pictures I got here. I'll, I'll flash through the pictures. But everything is going to go up on a nuclearproctologist.org. Uh, once again, all we find is mussels. All we find is nothing. Devoid of all life. Devoid of all habitat. Devoid of the indigenous species that we expect to see. Um, that kelp you see in there is not even healthy. But it's still trying. It's still showing up. It's just single generations of anything that we see. It's obvious to me that this happened quite a while back, that this was an extinction event, um, you know, in the sake of everything on the shoreline was wiped out in, in a short period of time. And so the disposition would have came over from Japan because it was three melter reactors. And so that came over and it continued to come over. And so that continued to wash out to the coastlines. And we get heavy rains in British Columbia. It's total desolation. We don't see any recent dead life. We don't see any carcasses. We didn't see any kind of anything clinging to a rock that didn't look like it was trying to uh, fall off the rock. Dead. Oh, and now that picture back there, you can see there's some oysters. Oysters? I can't even pronounce it. Oysters. Yeah. Oysters. There is some oysters right there, folks. And you can see some mussels are hanging on. Some of the bigger mussels, they were unusual. We didn't see them anywhere else. And the name of this place was... Um, That's in Gibson's. No, that was... Um, hang on, I'll get the folder up. That was uh, Brew Bay Road. Oh, yes. Brew Bay Road. and But the pilings never had no sea anemones, no starfish, no uh, kind of uh, life. It just had the same thing everywhere you went. Everything was devoid of life. There was no whelks, no snails. There was no uh, limpets. There was none of the normal indigenous critters that I'm used to seeing my whole life on the ocean. So we'll switch off that and keep going. And we've got lots here. As we go further down the road, we we look harder. That's a little bit further down the road. That's another popular beach I usually go to. And I didn't clue in like everybody else until the last nine days when it really struck home for me in the boat ride. That's where we clued in. And you can see it's totally devoid and if you don't know what that looks like, we'll run back to the wire cast for a second. And we'll show you what some of that life should look like. On the shorelines, you would expect to see at low tide uh, lots of these little types. There's all types of these snails. They are very dominant. In the tidal pools, you would expect to see a very rich and vibrant. You would expect to see all kinds of uh, sand dollars. You would expect to see... Um, all kinds of starfish, all kinds of sea anemones, and you would expect to see them hanging off the rocks in large groups. Let's keep going. We'll go live back to the desktop presenter. Let's roll through another bunch of these. This was a few miles down the road. These are all pristine places in between parks, and we got a lot of parks we're going to cover. Public parks here right along for 200 kilometers. Um, and that's what Desolation Sound is all like this, no different whatsoever. And we got videos of that, and we'll be posting that up on Beautiful Girl by Dana. I can't put that up on the Nuclear Proctologist, but I will link to over from there to those videos on 
the same sites you're probably watching this on or linked over. And as you can see, we work with a $300 camera and we work with a $300 boat ride and everything else came out of Terry's pockets, literally and figuratively, including uh, food and fuel, transportation. And we're not saying nothing, we're just letting you know the budget we had so you can understand the quality and the things that we've done in more context. But the enormity of it is what drove us. We wanted to find life so we can say, instead of there's a total extinction, that there's serious life still living and we need to do something immediately because we know how big of a range it was. Each day became more uh, surreal to get up in the morning. It became more surreal to drive down to these beaches. Now, this kelp, really good shots, Terry. You've done a good job on that. I left you out of the conversation up to now. But you're the guy who walked out here, Terry. And you had to work like a dog just to find mussels. You had to work like a dog just to get pictures of a couple of uh, starfish that will be coming up here. And there's a seagull here coming up in this picture. We'll jump ahead to that picture. And uh, it'll look a bit funny to people right here. Where's that seagull to? Is he in this picture? Yeah, here he is. He's out there by himself, and he's surrounded by four species. There's no other species, no insects, there's no marine life. This is prestigious areas. These are gorgeous, absolutely unimaginable gorgeous area. And I, I thought it was striking, utterly striking, this picture right here. This picture right here where he just looks at the water. To me, that really symbolized everything I've seen in any bird that I had saw in nine days. There wasn't very many of them. We can put all the birds we saw all the mussels we saw, all the starfish we saw, at, in 200 kilometers for sure, in the back of a pickup truck, most likely in a wheelbarrow. And it's really something shocking. Uh, yesterday we hardly talked on the way home from the end. And let me explain something to you. What you're seeing here, there should be insects, there should be in entire communities just right there in that little tiny spot, just in a five foot patch, you shouldn't be able to count the different life there without spending a whole lot of time there. And there's zero. It's zero. The rocks are naked. Right around the tidal pools, there's nothing gripping onto them. Little tiny ping things are trying to hang on. But Fukushima is not going to allow that to last. And it's probably going to kill everything out there, but it can't come back. It won't kill. You know, it might leave something out there somewhere and it can repopulate. You think about a ling cod can lay, or a codfish can lay 700,000 eggs. You think about how the ocean is a soup of life, and under normal circumstances, if you were to have a freak act of nature that wiped out the coastline, the ocean, the soup of life, would repopulate it immediately. And so when you go there, and right across the board, there's nothing. But you see how that kelp is actually healthy looking. A lot of the mussels, even though they're patchy, they're trying. And so we have to try. We have to stop the lying, the madness, the, mon the, the maniacal lying from the, the apologists have led us to this. And the fact that journalists haven't bothered to call them out on it or to stop it and they allow it, right? Now we need, at this stage now, we have to go look at the rest of the coast. We have to assume that the entire Pacific Basin, America, Canada, Alaska, Everything, Vietnam, everything is going to have these same probabilities. And you can go down at low tide and take pictures. It's that simple. And if the life is missing, then we have it across the board. But the north, the 26,000 islands up here that I dove year after year, well, I'm going to have to go back there. I'm going to have to go back there. We're going to have to launch an expedition, and we'll keep going to go up just so we have hope, so we have to know. Because this is not localized, because what the ocean does is it repopulates it. If you went down to a beach that was full of life and plowed it all off, the ocean, the soup of life that it was, would populate that with babies in a matter of weeks. Everywhere you went, you see baby sea cucumbers, baby snails, baby mussels, baby sea anemones. You would see it every square inch, massive. This is what I've done all my life. And that's what makes the difference between my story and everybody else's story is I intimately understand that that deer, what you're looking at, right, there's nothing there. But when you look at it in real perspective, and I'll bring up some pictures, 
right? Those tidal pools should look like that, even out of the water. It should look like that. See? Right? The flannas, the floras, and everything should still vividly stand out, even in the shallow pools. The sea anemones would blow themselves up. The, here's a really good picture. The whole coastline was like that. I know, I traveled it year after year. I stayed out there for 100 days at a time without coming ashore. I lived, eat, and breathed this all day with people that done the same thing. Um, and so I don't know what to say to people outside of, you know, I'm, I'm straight up. I'm not going to try to hide anything away from you because that that's what got us in this position in the first place. There's no kelp force anywhere to be seen. A couple of more grabs of this. As you can see, as Terry verified, and Terry's word is good enough, I don't need the pictures. But Terry got all the pictures. Right? And look at the life there. What's left there is crumbs. It's just crumbs. It lived there before at some point, but it's not there now.